Hello, 10th grade honors. Um, we're back and today we're going to be exploring some of the literary devices present in Macbeth Act 2, Scenes 1 and 2. So let's get started. So the five themes, the five devices that we're going to be looking at are Shakespeare's diction, looking to a higher power for strength, the power of prophecy, disturbance in the macrocosm, and objective correlative. So we're going to begin with the repetition and similarities in Shakespeare's diction. Now I pointed this out to you guys before, but in Shakespeare's plays, he likes to use similar words or the same words over and over again to stitch uh, meaning into the, the minds of the, the readers. So for instance, we've seen murder only used a few times in the play so far. And why is that? Well, it's because this idea of murder is so damning to Macbeth's conscience that he has to use other words for it to be, make sense for him. He calls it hard image, a suggestion. Lady Macbeth calls it business. Macbeth calls it assassination. Lady Macbeth calls it enterprise. There's one point where they just call it it, the deed. But what it really is, is murder. So let's take a look at where this occurs in Act 2 so far. So if we just do a quick search for business, we see Lady Macbeth say, he that's coming for must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business. Well, why not just call it what it is? It's murder. When Macbeth thinks about it, he calls it a suggestion. Why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs? So as we're going through the play today, keep in mind that these words will be used in place of murder. We're going to move into the looking to a power, looking to a higher power for strength uh, device or theme. It's like a motif, and uh, it's seen many times throughout the play so far. In the beginning of the play, we saw Lady Macbeth look to a higher power for strength. Uh, she said. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. Come to my woman's breast, take my milk for gall. We've seen Macbeth say, Stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. And we're going to see again him use this. He says, Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps. Which way they walk, for fear the very stones prate of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. But Banquo, early in the play, will actually look to the heavens for strength, and we're going to talk about why this is so important. So in the beginning of scene one, Banquo and Fleance are having a conversation. And Banquo says to himself, a heavy summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I would not sleep. So when he says that, he means that he's summoned to sleep. He feels like he, he should be sleeping, but he can't. Well, why is that? It's because he's been intoxicated by the witch's prophecies. He then requests merciful powers. He's, who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the heavens. 
Restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. He's asking the heavens to give him strength not to give in to this evil temptation. So it's clear that the power of prophecy is starting to infect Banquo as well. Because remember, and we'll come back to this, but the witches said that they were going to rob Macbeth of sleep. Well, it seems that they've robbed Banquo of sleep as well. And then Macbeth enters. And we see them have this conversation. And Banquo reveals to him, everything's good, but I dreamt of the last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. Macbeth, lying to Banquo, says, I think not of them. Yet when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business, if you would grant the time. So at a later time, I'd like to speak to you about what, her, what happened. And then Macbeth says something odd. He says, if you shall cleave to my consent when tis time, it shall make honor of you. So this is a debated part of the play, but I think that Macbeth is saying to Banquo, hey, some stuff's about to go down. And you're my right-hand man, so I want to get you in on it. But Banquo reminds him that he's loyal to the king. And he says, listen, I, I don't want to lose any of my honor. I, I'm not trying to augment my honor. I need to let you know that my bosom, my heart is franchised to Duncan. And my allegiance is clear. But I shall be counseled. We can talk about this. Good repose the while. Good sleep the while. And we see this word again used, repose, repose, to be in rest. But we know neither of them are going to be able to rest too well because the prophecies of the witches have infected them. So then Macbeth gets into his fatal vision soliloquy. And this is literally when he's speaking to a dagger that he's seeing. And now we can talk about the power of prophecy. So back to this timeline of cursed sleep. So in the beginning, the witches plan to rob Macbeth of sleep. Banquo demands that the witches reveal his future as well. Lady Macbeth planned to kill Duncan in his sleep. And Banquo reveals that he is having difficulty trying to sleep. So we see this like timeline of, of how sleep is being compromised by the character's actions. So I want to talk about objective correlative because it really relates to the next soliloquy. So objective correlative is one way of expressing, is, is the only way of expressing emotion. Um, so emotion, there is no narrator in a play. So similar to like an aside and another literary technique called disturbance in the macrocosm, this objective correlative is needed to display a character's most complex emotion. So in a narrative, when a character is, is feeling emotionally conflicted, the narrator, narrator will be able to explain that to the, to the reader. But we don't have that in a play. So we need something to express that emotion. And T.S. Eliot, who came up with this, who was a... Uh, a literary scholar said, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events, which shall be the formula of that particular emotion, such that when the external facts, which must terminate in sensory experience are given, the emotion is immediately evoked. And what that means is that when the character experiences an emotion in a play, it must take the place of a set of objects, a situation, or a chain of events. So when Macbeth says, is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle towards my hand, come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. What does this dagger is the object? What is the emotion that Macbeth is trying to convey? Well, this dagger is a symbol. It's representative for desire, the desire to 
fulfill his enterprise to Lady Macbeth to become king. So let's take a look at the text. And he starts talking to the dagger. Are you, art thou, but a dagger of the mind, or a false creation, proceeding from the heat of pressed brain? I see thee yet in forms as palpable as which I now draw. So what he does is he draws his own dagger, the dagger that he's going to use on Duncan. And both the fatal vision dagger and his own dagger marshalist him, marshalist me the way that I was going. These are, these are directional arrows to his ambition. But then he comes to terms with, well, mine eyes are made the fools of all other senses, or else worth all the rest. But he sees the dagger still, and now the dagger has dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so there before. So now the blood, what is the blood the objective correlative for? Well, it's for the completion of the murder. But then he comes to terms with, there's no such thing. It is the bloody business that informs thus to mine eyes. So Macbeth cannot express this emotion um, to the reader of desire, of wanting this, this act to be over. So what Shakespeare does is he creates an object to correlate that emotion. Which brings us to our next device, disturbance in the macrocosm. So what is the macrocosm? The microcosm is the small world inside of us. So all of your thoughts and feelings and, you know, even, even something like the house that you live in. Well, the macrocosm is the big world all around us. So the sky and the sun and the moon and the stars and, and everything in nature. Macro, big, micro, small. Cosm world. So disturbance in the macrocosm occurs when morality is compromised. The world reacts. So you think of this disturbance. So Macbeth's murder of Duncan is an act of evil. And similar to an aside, disturbance in the macrocosm is a device used because there is no narrator. So in a narrative, in a, in a novel, writers can create atmosphere through the narrator. They can talk about how the the bushes rustle, or they can talk about the overcast sky or the, the storm clouds, but in a play, they can't do that. So they have to use the, the voice of the characters to create this atmosphere. So disturbance in the macrocosm occurs three times before, during, and or after a horrific act. It is usually illustrated through the paranormal weather phenomena or other strange unexplainable events. So for instance, in Julius Caesar, Right before Julius Caesar is assassinated, um, a man walks through the streets on fire. Lions uh, come out of their cages. Horses are eating, eating themselves. Um, really strange events. And it's supposed to tell the audience and the other characters that something bad is going to happen. And we see this all throughout Act Two. So right after Macbeth comes to terms with, okay, there is no dagger, he says to himself, now over the one half world, nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howl his watch thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. So what does this mean? So we'll break this down. Now over the one half world, nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. All this means is it's getting dark outside right now. Over the half of the world, half of the world's in daylight, half of the world's, uh, it's night out. And when it gets dark out, what happens? Well, witchcraft comes out. Pale Hecate, uh, who was the goddess of witchcraft, uh, celebrates her offerings. And withered murder is alarmed. So now it's time to kill people because we are alarmed by the sentinel, the wolf. And this wolf, whose howl watches over us, and he has a stealthy pace, like Tarquin's nat ravishing strides. Okay, who was Tarquin? Let's find out.
He was the legendary and seventh and final king of Rome. So this is some type of reference to ancient Rome. Uh, moves towards his design and moves like a ghost. And this is where he gets into his looking to a higher power for strength. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps. Which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time, which now suits with it. Whilst I threat he lives, words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives, and a bell rings. And that's Lady Macbeth ringing the bell, letting him know, I go and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. And we have our classic end of scene rhyming couplet to bring us to the next scene. And we don't see the king get murdered. It wasn't politically smart for Macbeth to have a king being murdered on stage. Uh, Macbeth was, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't make any sense for Shakespeare to do this. Shakespeare's biggest patron was the king of England. So Shakespeare wouldn't want to rough on any feathers. So this murder happens off screen. If you want to see the murder happen on screen, uh, there's a bunch of performances that, I've, that are available through Amazon Prime um, and on YouTube where you can see this happening. Um, so now we're going to move into scene two. And Lady Macbeth opens up. That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What has quenched them hath given me fire. So she is acting all tough here, but then she hears an owl hoot. <gasps> she shook. This is not the Lady Macbeth that we saw in the, in the Act one, she is shook now. It was the owl that shrieked, the fatal bellman what gives the sternest good night. And she says, and this is where we see this Shakespeare, Shakespearean diction, he is about it. What does that mean? What is the it? Why not just call it murder? Um, and we know that he is, they've drugged the grooms and Macbeth is going to murder Duncan and they're going to pin the murder on the grooms, which are the servants. And Macbeth says, who's there? What? Ho? Um, and Lady Macbeth, it's really dark out, guys. They did not have electricity during this time, so she's wondering what happened. And he says, I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? When? Now? As I descended, I. And take a look at this word, descended. It literally means as he came down the steps. But symbolically, figuratively, maybe it means as he descended in his in his trek towards hell, in his, his descent towards uh, immorality. So now they're just having this conversation. Who's in the second chamber? Oh, it's the, it's the youngest son, Donald Bain. And we see a lot of regret in Macbeth's voice. And this is where I want to remind you about this objective correlative. Because all throughout this scene, Macbeth is experiencing a flurry of emotions and Lady Macbeth as well. So they need to, they need these emotions to be uh, come to life through objects or a situation or a chain of events. So for instance, for instance, this conversation they're have is the situation and there's a lot of confusion. Um, but let's really get into what the objects are. So one thing that happens is Macbeth hears these uh, words from the grooms. For instance, one of them laughed in his sleep at him, and one cried out, murder, that they did wake each other. I stood and heard them, but they did say their prayers and dressed them again to sleep. So what is happening to Macbeth? Um, is he really hearing this, or is he, is this really happening, or is this all in his head? Is this the witches speaking through the grooms? We don't know, but we know Macbeth has regret because he wouldn't be hearing these things if he didn't. Another said, God bless us and amen to each other. But I couldn't say amen back to them. I could not, I could not hope that they would um, be blessed because he knows they can't. He knows he's going to cause their death. And then he hears, sleep no more. Macbeth doth murder sleep, the innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleep of care. The death of each day's light, sores labor, Beth, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feasts. He hears this from the guards, and now he's freaking Lady Macbeth out. What do you mean? 
Well, what did ha why is this so important? Because remember, guys, in the beginning of the play, the witches said, Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. They are going to curse him. We see all this, all this, these references to sleep. Now, what do you mean he's not going to sleep no more? Is he not going to literally sleep or is he just not going to be able to have rest? So Lady Macbeth starts telling Macbeth, she brings up this idea of water. Wash this filthy witness of your, off your hands. Macbeth has blood on his hands. And what, she, and what she's saying is, you need to wash this deed off your hands. We need to get rid of this. You need, you, were, you, know, you need to look like the flower because there are people who are going to be entering our scene pretty soon. And she says, infirm, you are sick of purpose. Give me the daggers, the sleeping and the dead are but his pictures. Tis the eye of child of the fears of painted devil. And then Macbeth starts to hear knocking. And this knocking is the object for his emotion, which is guilt. And he asks the question, and this is a really, really good scene. I'm sorry, a really good line because it's going to come up later in the play. And he asked the question, well, all of the great Neptune's oceans wash this blood clean from my hand. And we know that Neptune is uh, the Roman mythology equivalent for Poseidon, the god of the ocean. Well, all the oceans in the world wash the blood clean from my hands. And he says, no, this is such a horrific crime that there's nothing that I can do to wash this blood off my hands. I, I will never be able to get rid of this guilt, this, um, this horrific act. I am forever stained. No, my hand is so soaked with blood that if I dipped it into the ocean, it would make the multitudinous seas died with uh, uh, with blood, with making the green one red. And she reminds him, my hands are of your color, but I shame to wear a heart so white. And they keep hearing this knocking, knock, 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 knock. It's kind of like Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, sitting under the floorboard, knocking at his conscience. And is it really happening? Or is it symbolic for the crime that he committed, knocking at him. To know my deed, were best not to know myself. Wake Duncan with thy knocking, I would thou couldest. I wish I could wake you up, Duncan. I wish I could wake you up. And this is kind of like a parallel rhyming couplet because at the end of last scene, he's speaking to Duncan. He says, hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summoned thee to heaven or to hell. And he's speaking to a, a dead man walking, Duncan. But then he's speaking to the dead Duncan, saying to him, man, I wish I could wake you up. And we see all of this regret. So scene two is about regret. If, if the emotion that's being elicited in scene one is, sorry, is ambition and, uh, and desire, then scene two is, uh, is guilt and uh, regret. So just a reminder of the five topics that we covered today, Shakespeare's diction, looking to a higher power for strength, the power of prophecy, disturbance in the macrocosm, and objective correlative. And thank you to Slides Go for this sweet classroom PowerPoint. And you guys have a great day. And stay tuned because I'll be recording the lecture for um, Macbeth 2.3 and 2.4 soon. Have a nice day, guys.